get on the road here, and I'm going to talk about the United States history from my perspective of a Mormon libertarian. So we all know 1776, the Declaration of Independence, and there was that war on independence. You know, we had the Articles of Confederation for a while, and then it was like uh, U.S. Constitution, and then the first Congress under the U.S. Constitution passes the Bill of Rights. They actually passed 13 amendments. Ten of them were ratified by the states. And I know there's some documents out there that make people think that more than 10 of them may have been ratified, but I think those were a little premature. We have these rights that are given to us by the Bill of Rights. Well, not even 100 years. North and South conflict going on that finally explodes into a civil war. I do believe slavery was a part of it. The differences in the economies between the North and the South, as well as the representation within federal government. A lot of the problem was that the North, with their industrial economy, they didn't have the slaves, they didn't need the slaves. It wasn't important to them. The South, working on a more older economic model of farming that required a lot of manpower, they thought that slavery was so important to them. I think the Civil War could have been avoided. I really do. I think slavery would have been ended one way or another. If you know anything about Joseph Smith, modern day prophet who restored the gospel to its fullness, us Mormons were having this big plight. We have this big issue with persecution. Our First Amendment rights are being trampled all over. So Joseph Smith goes to Washington, D.C. to visit with President Van Buren and some of the other members of Congress to petition them for regress for all the bad stuff that happened to them in Missouri. He said, look, no, I can't help you. If you understand the, the mentality they had back then, that makes sense because they had recently gotten over this war of independence. There were still people alive who remembered it. Younger generations were getting firsthand stories about what happened and why they did it. And so there was this fierce feeling of independence among everybody. It wasn't just a political independence, it was a personal independence. People were much more self-sufficient. There was also this idea that the federal government was very much separated from the states. The states had a check against the federal government. The federal documents, the federal laws were more of a federal thing. They didn't necessarily affect the states so much. So why is this important? Well, it goes back to a revelation of prophecy that Joseph Smith received a few years before. While this conflict in Missouri was going on, and basically he was told that, hey, you know, seek for regress. Go to the judge, go to the sheriff, go to the governor. If none of those work out, go to the federal government. And so that's what he did. He took the steps that, you know, starting at the local level, trying to resolve the issue at the local level, and working his way up. And finally, when it didn't, didn't get resolved, God said, I will smite my wrath down upon this country, upon these people. And thus the Civil War. Well, another interesting thing about this too is that there was an Illinois judge who was sympathetic to the plight of the Mormons who had helped Joseph Smith get out of some trumped up charges that were just crazy stupid threw him out on a technicality. Well, Joseph Smith had dinner with this judge and spent a few hours telling him all about what was going on. And then Joseph Smith also told him, you're gonna run for president, which he did against Abraham Lincoln. Now, if he had won against Abraham Lincoln, the Civil War probably wouldn't have happened. If the federal government had done something to curtail what was going on in Missouri, and stop the assault on people's First Amendment rights, rights to property, rights to free speech, to religion, to all those things. So what was going on in North Carolina at the time that eventually ended up in the Civil War, maybe that would have been compelled because they would have said, oh, look what they did in Missouri. 
federal government really does have some teeth here and could stop us, slavery would have ended eventually because the economic model that it represented was dying all around the world. It was dying. But Abraham Lincoln finally came down and said, you states, you don't have as much sovereignty as you up to that point had typically been accepted as their sovereignty. Snowball effect of pushing power from the individual, from the local communities, from the states. And so you get more and more of this power filtering up, giving the federal government more power, giving the president more authority, more than was ever originally intended. 1913 comes around and a few interesting things happen. Income tax, the Constitution already gave Congress the ability to raise taxes. What it did was allow them to tax unproportionately. And they needed this because the original sell of the income tax was that only going to tax richest, 1%. With the income tax being levied, they wanted to. They went back to the original reasons of the Declaration of Independence as a justification for the 17th Amendment saying, no taxation without representation. That created a, another usurpation of, of state sovereignty and it made it appear as though they were giving it to the people when in reality it just made the federal government stronger. It gave the, a more direct connection from the federal government down to ruling the people. This took us from being a representative republic a little more towards being a democracy. The majority of democracies have failed, miserably failed, as soon as the people start to realize they can vote for handouts. And it all starts to fall apart from there. Plus you have mob rule. And by mob rule I mean you have the majority saying this is the way we're going to do it. I don't care about your individual rights, your individual freedoms, your individual ideas, your individuality. Don't care about that. This is what the majority wants. So no longer do you guys get to be individuals. You have to go along with the majority. Congress hit 435 members. It did one little bump up, two more at one point for one session, but pretty much after that, it's never gone higher than that because they passed a law to say, we're not going higher than this. And the justification for that was administrative. They said, well, we can't deal with more. This is already too many people for us to, to work effectively and efficiently. What they forgot, the way the Constitution set up our representative republic, it was not meant to be efficient. It was meant to be hard to get things done, to protect the rights and freedoms of the people and to keep government out of their lives. Back then, when you had 30,000 people, you had another representative. However, some places it's closer to half a million, other places it's closer to a million. How can a single representative be able to be a voice, a proper voice, for that many different people that all have different issues different problems, they live in different cities. The fourth thing that happened, they created the Federal Reserve. And this was done on December 31st when a lot of the congressmen were off doing their, their Christmas holidays and whatnot. They snuck this thing under the table and snuck it through. Now gold and silver before this were used as monetary exchange and whatnot. And it got manipulated too. There was greedy people manipulating that as well. It had its ups and downs because of this manipulation. You had depressions and, and things like that because of those manipulations. It happened then too. It's not, nothing new. But with the Federal Reserve in place, it was so much easier. Such a bigger problem that, that it caused the Great Depression. It was massive compared to what had happened in the past. When federal government steps in, takes more power from the states, takes more power from the individual, throws in all these socialist programs, says we're going to save everybody, we're going to fix everything, we're going to do all this stuff to make it better. And some people, and I think rightly so, suspect that this was all the original design 
Now, again, being a Mormon, being a religious person, I don't think any one person or any one organization could have calculated this conspiracy over the last couple hundred years to turn this new republic into a quasi-democracy where everybody is greedy and, and freedoms are being ripped away and taken away that had been fought for and won. When you start to look at things spiritually, you start to understand that there's more going on in this world than just what we can see and document and read. That there is a spiritual side to things. The spiritual things aren't so easy to see or understand. You've got Satan out there going, hey, a new country. Yeah, I remember the Romans. I remember that big imperialistic country. We can do something similar here. Yeah, yeah, the Babylons. I remember their monetary system. We could implement that here. We could influence people here and do that here again. So that's where the real conspiracy is. It's not the Illuminati or the Rothschilds or anything like that. Those people are doing what they think is right by them. And there are some evil people out there. And then there's Satan who's whispering in the ears of people. This is where the conspiracies come from because it is coordinated. There is obviously a coordinated effort trying to drive our country away from its origins into something completely different, something where we don't have as much freedoms, where the federal government rules with an iron fist like Stalin did. A couple hundred years it's taken. It's hard to pin that on any one thing, but when you start pinning that on Satan, and pinning that on him trying to take away our free agency, which is our ability to choose for ourselves, to decide what we want to believe for ourselves, to have the ability to live our lives and be happy by living proper principles and living the right way, he wants to make that difficult for us because he wants us to be miserable like him, it's to not to be saved by Jesus. He wants, doesn't want any of that. The evil versus good battle that's been going on long before our country was created. And so now today, we have this fear, huge fear over who's going to be the president. We are more divided today than we have ever been probably in our entire history. This is not a political issue. This is a cultural issue. Our culture has been changed. And again, this is, this is Satan working behind the scenes saying, hey, let's, let's, let's get rid of the traditional stuff that has worked for millennia, that has helped families to be happy together, that has helped societies to be stable, to help. Let's get rid of all that and let's, let's change everything. That's oh, all old stuff. That's all outdated. This new stuff, it's cooler, it's awesome. Do whatever you want. You can be awesome and cool. And then we create this division in our society that has continued to grow and grow and grow. And today we are more divided than we've ever been. With a single office in our country having more power than it has ever had before. And that is the fault of both Republicans and Democrats alike. More power, more power, more power. We want to do it our way. We want the power to do it our way. We want the influence to do it our way. We want to be able to do it our way. And so now you've got this huge divide between Democrats, Republicans, conservatives, liberals, whatever label you want to throw on them. This divide is huge. When Barack Obama was elected president, there were conservatives that were just outraged. This, this socialistic liberal is in power. Ah, it's the end of the, the country. Fortunately, our constitution is stronger than one office. But Barack Obama did manage to get more power and more power and build up his the president to be this even bigger thing, bigger than what Bush managed to do with the Patriot Act, bigger than what Ronald Reagan managed to do with tons and tons and tons of military spending greater than what Bill Clinton was able to do with his uh, scheming. His wife is just as bad. I do believe there is a group of rich elitists who want to fundamentally change America. So now you've got all these people who think everything needs to be done differently and you've got all these people who think we need to do things traditionally. And that's really the very definition of liberal and conservative. Conservatives want to conserve or keep things the same. Liberals want to liberate or 
change things. I know people today have their own ideas of what those things mean, but when you really break it down and you really look at what it means, really where those words come from, and they still have that meaning today. Our founding fathers were considered liberals. So they wanted to change the status quo. The conservatives were the people born of the kings. And of course today we would call them classic liberals, which is essentially what libertarianism is. Now Trump wins the election and all the conservatives that were so upset over Barack Obama are now happy. And all the liberals that were so happy about Barack Obama are now upset. It's not a matter of who the president is, it's a cultural issue, as well as just the fact that we have a, an office, a presidential office, that has way more power than it should. Who the president is should not matter to any of us. It really should be a federal executive office that is appointed by the states, based on the Electoral College, to execute the laws. Laws that are passed, not by a president, not by executive order, not because there's all these bureaucracies out there that he can write policy for through an executive order to make him do things the way he wants them to do, because Congress who created those bureaucracies gave those bureaucracies a vast amount of power that can be influenced and changed based on their policies. The Constitution doesn't give them give Congress even the right to create regulations. It gives it the right to create standards, and yet we have regulations up and down, left and right, all over the place, being created constantly every day because of all these bureaucracies that the president has control over, and by a swipe of his pen through an executive order, he can change those on a whim. That's the real problem. That's what we need to get rid of, and the only way you're going to get rid of that is not by voting for the president. The president doesn't matter in that regard. It, you know who the most powerful person politically in our country is supposed to be? And still is in some regards? It's the Speaker of the House. Congress that we should be worried about who we're electing. The election for president is a distraction to keep us from looking at the real issue. Congress still, in a lot of ways, has more power than the president does. And until we get back to worrying about who we're electing for Congress, which again is difficult because a single congressman represents so many people, so many different views, it's hard to get a good one up there. You have to compromise between all these different viewpoints to get one that actually gets elected and then they don't really represent anybody because they're not, they're just a conglomeration of all these different people focus on who your congressman is going to be, who your senator is going to be. Even more important than that, because the states still have some sovereignty left and they can still block federal programs from being executed and done in their states. Who are your state representatives, your state senators? Who's your governor? And the people who have the most effect on you directly, most directly, who are you electing to your city council? Everybody's part of a county. Who's your sheriff? Sheriffs, because they're elected by the people, can block federal enforcement and say, no, I'm not allowing that warrant to be served in my county. The sheriff can still be overturned through a court, give more time for things to be heard and things to be worked out appropriately. If we really want to make America great again, we've got to step up, step up as people of this country, as individuals, not putting all of our hopes and wishes and dreams in one man. Trust in God. Take responsibility for yourself. Peace.